The hearing will come to order. Good morning. Uh, this subcommittee meets today to receive testimony on air dominance and the critical role of fifth generation fighters. We welcome our distinguished witness today, Major General Jerry Harris, Vice Commander of Air Combat Command, United States Air Force. General Harris, we thank you for your service and we look forward to hearing from you and your important testimony today. This hearing will be the first of two oversight hearings the subcommittee plans to hold on air dominance and the critical role of fifth generation fighters. Air dominance means that friendly aircraft can't fly anywhere in enemy territory and can also be effective at performing their mission. Today's ground and naval forces count on our combat air forces to provide air dominance so that movements of troops, supplies, weapons, and ammunition can quickly be brought to bear in order to win decisively. Here at the National Museum of the United States Air Force, I can't think of a more appropriate place for us to begin this series of air dominance. Those of you who have toured the museum have noted aircraft such as the P-51, which was developed in World War II to defeat the threat posed by the German uh, for, for forces. The Korean War brought new challenges such as the jet-powered MiG-15, which our Air Force answered with the F-86, eventually resulting in a 14 to 1 kill ratio over North Korean fighter aircraft. The Vietnam War saw the advent of radar-guided service-to-air missiles which resulted in the development of the F-105G Wild Weasel aircraft designed to detect and destroy those missiles which were threatening our nation's capability to achieve and maintain air dominance. After the Vietnam War, lessons learned and technical advances by both our nation and near peer adversaries required the introduction of new fighter aircraft like the F-14, F-15, F-16, and F-18, which we call on today. <clears throat> And we call these fourth generation fighter aircraft characterized by improvements in maneuverability, radars, sensors, and weapons. That fleet of aircraft overwhelmingly achieved air dominance in the first Gulf War, Operation Desert Storm. Although modified somewhat to keep pace with threats, our fighter aircraft inventory today is comprised largely of those fourth generator fighter aircraft we used in Operation Desert Storm. Like we have seen historically since World War II, our adversaries have not stood still in their efforts to counter American air dominance since Operation Desert Storm. Integrated air defense systems with more powerful radars and more accurate and longer range missiles have been developed. Many of these systems are so mobile they'll be much more difficult to target. Our adversaries are also developing advanced fifth generation aircraft which include the Russian Sukhoi T-50 and China's J-20 and J-31. To maintain future air dominance, our nation will require a fleet of fifth generation aircraft characterized by a much lower radar signature to negate our adversaries' advances in radars and radar guided missiles. Our fifth generation aircraft will also need to have machine to machine interfaces giving pilots unprecedented situational awareness of where those mobile surface to air and air to air threats are in real time. Our air dominance force of the future will need to have the capability, capacity, and readiness to meet those future challenges and threats. The Air Force's current fleet of fifth generation fighter aircraft consists of the F-22 and the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter. This subcommittee has received briefings from the National Air and Space Intelligence Center, or NASIC, located here at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, on the threats we are currently facing. And I am convinced now more than ever that we must resource and invest in fifth generation fighter capability. The investments we make now must be based on capability and countering the threats facing our national security. We only produced 187 fifth generation F-22 aircraft, but that number was 194 aircraft short of the requirement of 381 F-22s. Unfortunately, the decision to stop F-22 production was a strategy driven by budgeting goals rather than one driven by the need to obtain a required capability. That's why the House Armed Services Committee directed the Secretary of the Air Force to provide a, a report to the Congressional Defense Committees on the costs associated with restarting the F-22 production line to procure those 194 additional F-22s. Regarding the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter, the Marine Corps achieved initial operation capability in the F-35B Joint Strike Fighter with 10 aircraft at Marine Corps Air Station Yuma, Arizona last year. Between August and December of this year, the Air Force will achieve its initial operational capability with the F-35A at Hill Air Force Base in Utah. This is good news and indicates that the F-35 Joint Strike Fighter is remaining on cost and schedule. And we're, however, we're currently not producing F-35s at the rate that we had planned even last year. 
That's why the House passed the National Defense Authorization Act for the fiscal year 2017 by adding five F-35As to meet last year's Air Force F-35A budget plan for 48 aircraft in fiscal year 2017, an unfunded requirement identified by the Air Force Chief of Staff. The House bill also added additional F-35Bs and Cs for the Navy and Marine Corps, also unfunded requirements identified by the Navy and Marine Corps. Our nation has met the challenges uh, to, for air dominance in the past, and I am confident we will do so now and in the future. But we must remain committed to providing the resources necessary to provide the capability, capacity, and readiness necessary to accomplish the critical mission of maintaining air dominance. Uh, before I, I begin, I would like to uh, recognize each of the members of our panel today and then give them an opportunity to also provide an opening statement. Uh, Dr. Winstrup uh, from the Cincinnati area serves on the uh, Armed Services Committee and on the Intelligence Committee with me. Uh, I have Representative Shabbat, uh, who is also from the Cincinnati area and serves as the chair of the Small Business Committee. And we have Representative Stivers uh, from Columbus, uh, who also serves on the Financial Services Committee and the Rules Committee. Uh, which is the committee that determines all of the business that gets to the House floor. Um, I appreciate each of you participating, and it's great that we can, with the what I would call the powerful Ohio delegation, uh, constitute a full uh, field hearing uh, on this very important topic. And with that, I'd like to recognize Dr. Winstrup. Doctor. Well, thank you very much. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today, and I want to thank uh, all those here at the museum and the Air Force for for hosting us. But I think it is important that we discuss. Um, the maintain, maintenance of air dominance and the role of the fifth generation fighters that are playing, especially in comparison to our traditional adversaries uh, in the world. It's really a precondition for any military victory to be able to control the skies. Our ground forces rely on it. Uh, they expect it. Uh, it affects our ground maneuvers. Uh, I'm an Army guy, so I'm speaking from the ground. And, and also as, a, as an Army doctor, it affects our medevac operations, which is very important to our troops, obviously. Uh, I think that we've enjoyed the dominance in, in, in the air, and we have to continue that, uh, as well as dominance in air, land, sea, cyber, and space that uh, are so important today. But, you know, as we've seen over a decade of war or more, We've seen recession and budget constraints, and there's concerns over modernization, obviously, and maintenance and training for our, for our troops, especially in the air. And so it's important to note also what our adversaries are doing, and so I hope that's part of our conversation today as best we can uh, to talk about what we need to do to, to prioritize modernization and technology. So I enjoy the opportunity to be here today with you, and I uh, look forward to your testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Representative Shabbat. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for holding this uh, subcommittee hearing uh, today at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base in, in your district. Um, I happen to uh, represent Warren County now, and a lot of the folks uh, from Warren County work here at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, so we especially uh, appreciate that, uh, and thanks for the invitation uh, to be here. Um, I would also like to especially thank uh, Major General Harris and all those uh, who have served our country or are currently serving our country uh, in, in the military. Um, we appreciate the sacrifices that all of you are making uh, for us every day and the need to make sure that we provide our men and women uh, on the front lines with the very best equipment uh, that's available while also implementing the right strategy. Uh, to maintain our air dominance, and to a great degree, that's what this hearing is about, is maintaining that, that air dominance. I'd uh, like, I certainly look forward to hearing uh, Major General Harris uh, about the strategy to prepare our Air Force for the future uh, to confront the numerous growing threats. I'm especially pleased that we were able to hold this hearing at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. This base is a vital asset to our military uh, and comes with a great tradition and history. Um, my uh, my dad, who was a World War II veteran, uh, and my mom, uh, for many years, got their uh, their uh, health care here at Wright Patterson Air Force Base. They drive up here from Cincinnati, and it was outstanding care. And I, I certainly appreciate uh, what uh, the care that they they got here. Um, and uh, our family used to come up here for the uh, the Dayton Air Show, which is, I believe, this weekend or it is. this weekend. So we'd encourage folks uh, who may. Uh, see this hearing to come here to Wright Patterson Air Force Base and, and enjoy that experience. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, Wright Pat, at least 
a lot of the name is, is the Wright brothers who grew up right here in your hometown of, of Dayton, o Ohio. And uh, uh, I'd, I'd like to highly recommend a, a book that I brought along uh, with me, a little prop here today. Um, this showed up on my desk about a month ago. Um, we reformed the, the gift, uh, uh, congressional gift laws, and there's bans on certain stuff you can get, but we can still get books. And I'm kind of a cheapskate, so when I get one, I, I virtually always read it. Um, and this one was great. It's called The Wright Brothers. It's by David McCullough. I strongly recommend it. Um, and uh, so that's the only ad I'm going to give during the course of this hearing. But I, I, again, Mr. Chairman, I appreciate you holding this here and yield back my time. Thank you. Th thank you for acknowledging the David McCullough's book. The Library of Congress actually had um, David McCullough in. Uh, to do a presentation on his book, and I was very honored to have Stephen Wright of the Wright family uh, present with me. But it was, um, it was nice to hear him highlight Dayton's role in the Wright brothers' success, and it not just be a story being told in Dayton, um, because he actually saw that um, that Dayton itself, its infrastructure, was critical in the Wright brothers being able to achieve what they did. I thought that was certainly a great story. Um, I, in representing Steve Stivers, I also want to acknowledge that. Uh, Dr. Winstrup and Representative Stivers currently serve in our armed forces. So in addition to serving their country uh, in Congress, they also serve in the armed forces, and we certainly thank them both for that. Well, thank you, and thanks for uh, allowing me to be here. I want to thank uh, Chairman Turner for holding this hearing. You know, he's a true leader on the House Armed Services Committee, and especially anything involving air power, he's the go-to guy. And I'm just excited to be here at Wright Pat. I want to thank uh, the folks from Wright-Patterson Air Force Base and the National Museum of the Air Force uh, for hosting us today as a 32-year member of the Army and a, currently a colonel in the Ohio Army National Guard. I appreciate what goes on above my head when I'm wearing the uniform and air superiority is important to everybody on the ground because if you control the air, it's easier to control the ground. I'm looking forward to General Harris's testimony and, and answering our questions, especially with regard to the F-22, F-35, Manning, and resources. So thank you for being here, General. Again, I want to say thank you to Congressman Turner for putting this together and for his leadership in our military to make sure that our military is at the cutting edge and can defend our own national interests. So thank you, Congressman Turner, for your leadership and I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. Well, General Harris, before I turn it over to you, I will tell you that you are speaking in front of a group that have been strong advocates for relieving of sequestration that, of course, has been a, a scourge on our military, has made it very difficult for us to achieve um, our ad advanced uh, acquisition programs, uh, and certainly has had a huge impact here right at wright Patterson Air Force Base, uh, where when sequestration went in place, over 12,000 people were furloughed. Uh, but you are speaking in front of a group that not only is sympathetic but has been actively working to set aside sequestration and its effects on your work. Mr. Harris, we look forward to your message. Thank you. Well, thank you, Chairman Turner and Congressman Winstrup, Chabet and Stivers. Thank you, too, also for your service and serving as Congressman. Uh, the opportunity to discuss the Air, Air Force capabilities and the challenges delivering air superiority is a, a great venue, and we appreciate your time. As the Vice Commander of Air Combat Command, I have the privilege to oversee 140,000 airmen and civilians. Uh, Air Combat Command is responsible for organizing, training, and equipping the air superiority mission. This mission, as you've heard in the opening comments, is instrumental in achieving freedom maneuver in the air, on the land, and on the sea, and it's a precondition for success. I am grateful that the committee shares our interests and that we are looking at the advancement of air superiority, and I know that your combined concern and collaboration and work with us will assist in achieving these results and what they provide to the country. Air superiority capability remains at the highest level, but our near-peer adversaries are closing the gap. The image you see with me today over my left shoulder uh, illustrates RF-35 compared to a Chinese J-31. It depicts our adversaries are not only impeccably imitating platform design, but they're also achieving comparable capabilities and technology. Improvements in the future and investments are certainly necessary to continue to outpace the adversaries in advance of this crucial mission. For my first main point, we recognize the absolute imperative need for air superiority and its importance in ensuring our national defense. The goal of ACC is to be so capable that our enemies choose not to fight. During Operation Iraqi Freedom in 2003, 
the Iraqi Air Force chose to bury their MiG-25s rather than face American air power. That's exactly the response we're looking for. Our fourth generation fighters continue to effectively maintain air superiority in the permissive environment, but advanced air defense systems are making that more difficult. Our advanced fifth generation fleet have moved into a more prominent role of anti-airspace or anti-access aerial denial, but continue to be limited numbers, and they are used as a balanced approach with our fourth gen fighters. It is critical to rapidly increase our fifth generation fleet to ensure that the air superiority capabilities in the future are maintained. Along those lines, I'd also like to thank the team for the five F-35s that were added to our F F upcoming fiscal year purchase. Second, our challenges do occur in our maintaining uh, the dominant reign in air superiority, but Air Combat Command has a vision and a plan to ensure continued success. One of our largest, our most, ex most expensive to overcome in terms of money, manpower, and time is the size of our force. We have 79 fewer fighter squadrons now than we did in Desert Storm, and we are more than 500 fighter pilots short on our roles. We have enacted a fighter, prize a fighter enterprise redesign to study and actively fix this. The Chief of Staff of the Air Force also commissioned Air Superiority 2030 Enterprise Capability Collaboration Team, and Chairman, if you're okay, I'll refer to that as ECCT from here on out, uh, and that's to highly address the uh, contested anti-access aerial area <coughs> denial environments of the future. This plan highlights the requirements of a family of systems for success, and multiple domains will include new air superiority fighter aircraft. Agile efficient acquisition will be the critical enable to attain this budget within a relevant timeline. 44 years ago was our last combat loss in the air-to-air -air arena in Vietnam. Yet near-peer adversaries are working towards being capable of ending that winning streak. It is the goal of ACC to advance air superiority capabilities to ensure that this never happens again. I thank you for the invitation to participate in this important hearing and to share our ideas on how to advance the mission and our defense of our nation. I welcome the questions, sir, from the chairman and from the members and ask that my written testimony be entered into the record. General, um, thank you. The, um, there have been recent news reports about the um, supply chain for uh, spare parts for operation of our equipment, uh, where even museums have been raided uh, for some of their parts. In fact, as we were touring today, uh, one of the, the uh, members with us said, uh, I wonder to what extent this museum is in this, the inventory supply chain of <laughs> spare parts for the Air Force. Um, could you please speak for a moment on the, um, on the pressures of sequestration, the effects that, that, that it has had? And one of the items I'd like you to also mention on is the effect that it has had on uh, rated fighter pilot personnel. Uh, so both um, you know, overall, where do you see um, sequestration doing, um, but also um, the concern of our ability to maintain air superiority while uh, having the personnel, uh, the manning to be able to accomplish it? Well, thank you, sir. Um, those are great questions. Sequestration is hard on the services and not just the Air Force but the entire de uh, department. Uh, we are struggling and we are challenged to achieve the mission's uh, success that, that our country expects of us and that's winning in a dominant fashion. Um, as much as sequestration has hurt, we need a stable budget that we can count on for year after year after year from our plans because, it, as you said, our fifth generation fleet is going to look different now than what we planned last year because of the changes that we have uh, put in front of us each year. So uh, our approach to that is, yes, we have a lot of fourth generation airplanes that we've intended to retire. We would like to get out of the fourth generation business to a fully fifth generation fleet, but we need to do that on a timeline that's both fast enough to ensure we have enough fifth generation airplanes uh, and not so fast that we outsize our ability to train to that mission. So uh, we will continue for the foreseeable f future, fly older fourth generation airplanes with dwindling part supplies that you mentioned where we will have um, raids to museums, really, it's, it, we have a boneyard process of, of airplanes that have been retired that are in, in the desert in, in Tucson that we're able to go out and pull parts from as airplanes as we need to when we can't get them from uh, diminishing manufacturing supplies. That will continue to be a problem for us over the next decade or two as we fly these older airplanes. Yet we try to modernize them and put in newer parts upgrades to give us better capabilities with that. 
uh, and, and that's one of the ways we're trying to work through so sequestration as a teammate rather than um, an adversary and that's part of what we need to do to, for our portion, our support of the nation. When it comes to the people and the cuts we've had to take for the last five to ten years, the Air Force has gotten smaller in an attempt to preserve the equipment that we have, but we realize we went too far and we'd like to thank Congress for the help in growing uh, over the last couple of years, uh, well, this year and, and next year, the authorized growth that we've had, which allows us to start getting at some of the manpower shortages. Fighter pilots are one of those, so we're in, we've increased uh, our throughput uh, of both Air Education Training Command pilot production, and then we're going to add in 17 and 18 additional F-16 training squadrons to produce more uh, F-16, uh, I'm sorry, more fighter pilots in general. So that's part of it, and we'd also like to thank Congress for the increase in the uh, aviation career incentive pay, which should allow us to retain some, a few more of our experienced uh, pilots, which is it's important to us also, not just developing and uh, bringing new ones on. And then finally, sir, maintenance. Uh, that's another manpower issue we've had where we've had significant cuts in our maintainers, and I would say right now uh, the, the chief quotes that about every squadron is 90% is, is man, so a 10% shortage, so one of every 10 people are not in the squadron doing work. That applies to our maintainers also. And we're finding that getting their expertise back is not easy, so we're trying to do some of our easier maintenance work at our training locations with contract maintenance so we can continue to produce and, and get the training and readiness that we need. But that, those contracts have to be hired from somewhere, and a lot of times a young maintainer that's on a flight line and realizes they could do the same thing in a civilian uh, in environment and not have to deploy and do those things, uh, that's going to be another drain on us. So we're working both the pilot side and the maintenance side to fix that. General, the number, numbers I have. General, the numbers I have indicate that um, due to experience levels, um, and the needs in air superiority uh, squadrons that um, you may already be over 700 uh, pilots short of your projected planes. Give us a feeling as to what that means. What does it take to catch up? Um, and what does it mean if we, if we continue with that shortfall? Sir, uh, again, that's a great question. Uh, your numbers are right on. We closed out last year over 511 Fs or fighter pilots short of what we need to be 100% manned. We expect to close this year out just over 700, so your numbers are on target. Um, what that means, the impact, is that right now we are still able to man all of our flying organizations at 100%, but all of our supporting staff, so my command staff, headquarters Air Force, those staffs are manned at about 25%, right in that vicinity. So. For every place you should have four fighter pilots, you have one doing all of that same work, providing the information, and that's that's impacting our ability to plan and foresee things in the future and uh, to, to do the things that we need from a staff perspective. How do we fix that is the increased production and uh, on the, the, the start to try and build an additional 100 pilots a year so we can reverse the trend of, of losing more to start building more, and we won't be able to fix a 700 shortfall in a year. Uh, but it will also retain some of the more experienced pilots, which are the ones that we've worked 10 to 15 years to develop, and they have a lot of combat experience that we would like to retain. So we're working on both ends of that spectrum, and we do that through um, job satisfaction, through the, uh, the pay and incentives that they get with that, uh, and, and to be honest, taking care of their families, because that's the most important part, is taking care of our airmen. Because that's just hitting the number. As, as you just described, it's not the only issue. It's ensuring that they have the experience level. Uh, you know, as we look to the operational capability of the F-35, and we need to make certain that we have the greatest capability, not just in the aircraft, but also in the pilots that are flying them. Yes, sir. Um, that experience in the F-35 is obviously we're building that today, but uh, the way we initially put the cadre into the F-35 on both the maintenance and the uh, operational side is uh, to have pilots that are experienced in other weapon systems go to fly there so they're new in the system but they're experienced uh, in the the overall environment and we're doing the same thing for the maintainers we're cross training them instead of an a10 or an f16 they're now working on an f35 and that's an easier transition than taking a brand new start from a technical recruit and building them up which we will be doing that shortly also thank you and dr winster thank you mr chairman uh, you know you that uh, graphic there is uh, very telling and obviously very concerning sure. and uh, likely a pretty clear indication of their ability to tap into what we are doing and our, our, our technologies. 
So given where we are right now, as you look at that, you can say, well, they're pretty much copying the outer structure. And as we continue to develop the F-35 and modernize it with, because things are changing so quickly, how do we protect that from getting in their hands as well? And I, and I don't mean to go into a classified area, but I mean, let, let me ask it differently. Are we, are we doing things at a higher level of scrutiny that may be able to protect us from them getting that information as well? Um, yes, sir. Uh, the way you present that is, is right on target. We are, but we're required to be transparent, and we see that now at the B-21, mm -hmm. where is our approach is we, we want to tell Congress everything, and we do. We just do it sometimes in classified formats instead of open formats. But it's not, I don't think, between our relationship that leaks like this happen. Uh, I think it also goes back to our defense contractors and our just our industrial database, where a lot of this is being worked within their own facilities uh, that we're seeing um, our adversaries catch up with different things. As you said, the mold line is exactly right. It, those airplanes look very similar. When you cut a line down the middle and you put them together, it, clearly there is some copying going on. Uh, but we see a lot of our adversaries are still struggling on some of the avionics. Their radars may not be as good, and they, they have engines that, that are not as good as what we're working on. So everything that we're putting together and integrate as a package, that's what's keeping us ahead of them. And then to continue to make sure that we're procuring in a number that, that allows us to have the numerical support superiority so that they don't want to fight us. Maybe we can feed them some bad information in the same process or something <laughs> along those lines. But um, so you, you talked a little bit too, sir, about uh, the challenges that you face with number of pilots, and you couple that with with budget reductions, um, lesser training opportunities, um, maintenance inadequacies. I mean, these, these are these are tough times. We get it. Um, my question is, how do we? Uh, and, and again, sometimes you're getting into classified information, but how do we best get the American people to get it? And for that matter, sometimes other members of Congress to really understand uh, the jeopardy that we're putting ourselves in. Well, the reason we need to keep modernizing is so that we have fewer blue losses, both in the air and on the ground. We're, we're trying to keep our military alive, and, and, and to be honest, in a war, kill more of their military. Um, that's what, it, when it boils down to it, that's what it's looking at. We've just completed uh, the first operational squadron who's not IOC yet, but uh, at a hill that should be soon. Um, just completed a deployment to Hill Air Force Base, and the airplane, while it's still immature, is performing fantastically. And how we get that information out to the public is very important. And using forums like this that are in the open will, will help us with that message. But that unit deployed, flew sorties, and then flew home, and had scheduled and planned to fly 88 sorties with seven airplanes and flew and, and actually were effective with 88 sorties. They didn't drop a single sortie uh, and every one of the targets they struck, they were 100% hit rate with precision munitions. So I, I couldn't ask for more of a, a mature system, let alone an immature system. So that was fantastic for us. And then because it's F-35 and fifth generation flying where they were, they were teamed up with some fourth generation fighters in scenarios that only the F-35 was surviving and some of our fourth generation fighters were taking losses. So clearly the airplane is performing the way we want. And when I talked with pilots two days ago, Thursday at Nellis, uh, they're very pleased with it. So uh, we do have modernization work to do. We've got some other things we need to integrate, additional weapon systems to put into it. But it really is the airplane that we're looking for and we're just trying to procure it at the rate that we need. And certainly that's in encouraging in that regard. That, but we are still asking so many to do much more with, with less. And, and uh, I think that probably makes it tough on your retention uh, as well, especially for pilots where there's opportunities in the private sector. You're always battling that, but maybe even now more so than others. But, um, uh, if there's things that we can try to do from, from Congress to turn that tide, uh, we'd certainly always be interested in knowing what those things are. Uh, but I think that that graphic right there is something that the American people need to see, uh, to know what we're up against. Um, it's, uh, you bring up a very interesting point uh, that we all recall from Iraq, where they buried their MiGs, right? You know, they didn't want anything to do with us. That's peace through strength. That's where we always want to be. So anyway, I thank you, and I'll yield back.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I would like to uh, reiterate something that uh, my colleague, uh, Congressman Stiver, said, and that's that uh, I, I would hope the people in the Dayton area uh, realize uh, how aggressive you have been in protecting Wright-Patterson Air Force Base that we're out here today. Um, we've had innumerable conversations and uh, about uh, sequestration and adequate funding for Wright Pat, et cetera. And I know you've done that with our colleagues on both sides of the aisle to make sure that this air base gets the support uh, that's necessary uh, for it now and into the future. And, and my question, um, General, would be: uh, uh, Could you discuss uh, uh, Wright Patterson Air Force Base's uh, specific role uh, in, in the near term? and in the future in, in air dominance and the protection uh, of our nation? Yes, sir. Um, Congressman Wright-Pat has a storied history that everybody's aware of with the birthplace of, of flight and everything that started here. And, and I'll be honest, when we look at Wright-Pat as an Air Force base, um, from Air Combat Command, I don't see fighters and bombers. What I see is that integral cell of all of our Air Force research labs that get their genesis from right here, and it's the scientists and the people at Wright Pat Air Force Base that look at some of the theories and the advanced um, initiatives that we're looking at. They study that across the labs, and they and they task and get so much work done for us that allows us to look at what is next. If we have fifth gen airplanes that are so capable but being caught, should we now look at sixth gen? And we see a lot of the genesis coming from that. Um, the way we treat a weapon system, uh, it's it. it it starts and ends right here at Wright Pat uh, with our A, um, Air Force LCMC, and it's our life cycle maintenance command that cradle to grave from an airplane when it first starts, or uh, to be honest, any weapon system, because they're not all airplanes. We have our command and control to include uh, our human design and our development of people. It all starts and ends right here, so uh, that's significantly uh, a, a portion of what Wright Pat does. But we've got other organizations such as SIMAF. That, that takes some of our capabilities and helps us integrate those and shows us what we can do uh, across the spectrum. And, and that power is, is central right here. Thank you very much, General. Sure. Um, next, General, I know we've already referred to the graphics up there, but I think uh, the similarities illustrated in there are so striking um, that it, it says a lot just by looking at, at, the, uh, at the, the picture. Um, could, could you discuss to the extent that you can in a uh, non-classified setting what role uh, cybersecurity warfare has in something like this and and how seriously we as a nation need uh, to take that. Sir, cybersecurity has a huge role because any information that we're doing in today's age, it's going to be electronic, the, the, what we're doing back and forth. It's not, I mean, we have ideas on the back of barman napkins, but we're using computers to plan, process, and disseminate everything that we're doing. Uh, so cybersecurity will play a huge role in that. Uh, and that can be a weakness at times when people are trying to steal things from us. So we have a huge defense effort that comes down to every single airman, soldier, sailor, and marine to make sure that we are doing what we're told to do and using the systems as we're supposed to rather than circumventing those. And that's not just the military, but that's with our defense contractors and everything else. Uh, we will always have concerns uh, of espionage and other events, but how we use these systems in cybersecurity, we can actually start monitoring some of that and making sure that we understand what's processing and who's doing what on our classified systems that, that significantly helps us. That's the internal threat. It's an un unclassed side for the uh, external threat. <coughs> and then cyber also is beginning to play a role as a warfighter. It is its own domain from an airman's perspective, and we think that air superiority can be helped through cyber. There are things that uh, our cyber professionals can do to reduce the effectiveness uh, of an adversary's capability, and that is something that we're looking at very hard now and working our way for the future. Thank you very much, General. Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Representative Stivers. Thank you very much. Thanks, General, for your testimony. And um, I'll quickly just uh, comment on something that both uh, Congressman Winstrup and Cong Congressman Shabbat brought up. When you look at that uh, graphic behind you, it is clear that is not by accident. Uh, this is a deliberate stealing and copying of our technology. We are lucky they cannot perfect it today, uh, but we have to do more in cybersecurity. Uh, I don't think our problem is with our uniformed personnel. I think we have an agency problem with a lot of defense contractors who are supposed to protect 
American secrets, and um, it's not always their bottom line they're protecting, it's the taxpayers and our own secrets uh, as a country, our technology. So uh, I'm gonna continue to fight to make sure that we raise the level of requirements on those contractors to protect our true national secrets. So uh, that was more a comment than a question, but um, I just want you to know that the uh, folks in uniform are doing a great job, but we need to expect more from our contractors. And there are people out across the world trying to steal our technology every day. And, it, and you can tell by looking at that picture uh, that that was no accident. That, that is stolen technology, and uh, I'm sure they got it through some cyber you know, stealing. So we need to uh, all, as a country, pay attention to that and be ready for the future. So I do want to talk about Manning U, uh, answered some questions from Congressman Turner about um, the shortage of your uh, rated pilots at this point. Uh, to what role can the Air Force Reserve and the Air National Guard uh, help this shortage by either allowing some of their pilots to be called to active duty or maybe assuming some missions? And I know you said you're actually shorting your own command staff and other things like that to meet the need at this point. Could those organizations supplement you know, your staff and other staffs as well uh, to make sure that we are able to meet the needs we're supposed to meet? Well, sir, that's a great question, and to be honest, they are already. They are in the exact same position we am. The staff that I talked about that's 25% man includes my Guard and Reserve teammates. Oh, wow. The 55 squad fighter squadrons that we have today includes our Guard and Reserve teammates. So they're wearing the same uniform we're wearing, and they are part of this daily effort with us. So the same pressures that are on me are on them as the airlines are hiring now and continue to do more in the future which is always a draw for pilots of any service uh, they're seeing the same vacancy rates that we are and as long as we have the ability to continue to use the guard and reserve to take airmen who are going to get out regardless of what we do and retain some of them for that capacity and that call up in the future then i think they're hitting the mark and doing exactly what we ask of them Yet, as you know, they're doing so much more because they're deploying at a rate that is significantly above what we would call a strategic reserve, and they are as ready as we are or as unready as we are on the active side, and they've been fantastic teammates for us. Thank you, General. Uh, with regard to the fourth and fifth generation aircraft, do you believe policymakers uh, in Congress should actually dedicate resources <coughs> to upgrading our fourth and fifth generation aircraft uh, to make sure that we can maintain our technological edge? Uh, yes, sir. I, I would say the team is, uh, uh, from Congress and uh, OSD's perspective, we are dedicating resources in that direction. We do need to upgrade our fourth generation airplanes to make sure they meet the, uh, the mandates to fly in the airspace and have the required equipment to just be able to fly like any other airplane, the airlines, those types of things, as we're changing our airspace structure. But then to continue to update the defensive and offensive systems that are on those, we are making our recommendation as to where those should go because 10 to 15 years from now, at the contested environments and the highly contested environments that we're talking about for air superiority, there may not be much room for fourth gen airplanes. That's why we're so concerned about getting the fifth gen uh, at the rate we need. and. Yes, we are still updating the F-22 and modernizing it with uh, the systems that go through it to make sure that as the threat evolves, so does our aircraft to stay in front of that. And we're doing the same thing with the F-35. So we're currently buying Block 3 F-type airplanes, and we'll soon have a Block 4 uh, that's coming off. And what goes into that is part of the ongoing study that we're doing from the Defense Department, and we'll look at the funding from Congress uh, it, it, through the normal processes. Thank you. I yield back uh, to the chairman. Thank you. Uh, Representative Stiver's question is a great passing of baton to then the work that I get to do next. Um, as you know, um, I chair the Air and Land Subcommittee, which means I write the portion of the bill for the National Defense Authorization Act that covers the acquisition programs for the Air Force and the Army. Um, we have gone through the House version of the bill, which has passed the House floor. The Senate bill is proceeding. Um, there are differences between the House bill and the Senate bill. And here's my opportunity to ask you questions that can help us in conference in advocating on the side of the, of the House bill. That's the context in which the question uh, is being given to you. Uh, Representative Stivers indicated about the modernization of the fourth generation and the fifth generation. 
Uh, although we will achieve the F-35, we will have to continue its modernization, which because of the manner in which the, the, uh, the plane operates, the heavy reliance upon electronics, as you indicated, um, is a significant undertaking in its, its modernization. Um, the GAO, which is actually based here at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, recommended that the F-35 follow-on modernization be treated as a whole separate acquisition program rather than just a continuation of the F-35 program. Now, on the House side, um, we were able to defeat that measure. There was an amendment offered that would have implemented that GAO recommendation. And the reason why we defeated it is because we had additional information post the recommendation from the GAO, and that additional information is that it would result in a six to 12 month delay and an over $13 million cost increase overall in um, the maintenance and the modernization of the F-35. Now, General Bogdan has uh, indicated uh, his opposition and that in his assessment uh, that the delay and the increased costs uh, exceed uh, the benefit of having the modernization program being treated as a completely separate acquisition program. Um, General, do you have a perspective on this? <laughs> well, Chairman, thank you. Um, I do, but part of that's outside uh, of ACC's area of expertise. So I'll defer on the cost and the scheduled delays to the JPO. I have no, no doubt that their authenticity is correct, I can say that. Um, I suspect they're very accurate with what they, they say because they're the ones closest to it and looking at it. My concern as Air Combat Command is if we do that, the additional oversight that will look into the program uh, will cost more, but it, more importantly, it's going to delay the upgrades. And it's, it's not minor things. It's upgrades to the electronic warfare system. It's uh, radar enhancements, it's new weapons integration, it's all of those things that we're trying to get to mature this weapon system in a hurry. And any delays that we have are going to impact not just the U.S. Air Force, but all three services that are flying that, and all of our partner nations that are, that are part of this funding. The, you know, they're paying their portion for the upgrade for the first time ever in any other weapon system. When they bought F-16s, they just paid for what the Air Force had already paid for, and now they're part of that investment. So I would I would hate to delay that because it might put it in jeopardy of other, other funding sources. So my recommendation is those capabilities become at risk if we delay, so we shouldn't delay. Thank you. Well, another provision that is in the House version of the NDAA uh, is uh, looking at uh, the costs of restarting the F-22 line. Now, the Air Force Chief of Staff recently said that it's not a crazy idea. I'll take that as an endorsement. Uh, the, um, um, you know, obviously there was a significant amount of shortfall in the number of F-22s uh, that were produced that goes directly to the capability of your command. Um, would you please give us, uh, you know, your, your view of the issue of the shortfall in the F-22? Um, any thoughts that you have on um, trying to um, produce additional ones to increase your overall uh, command capability? Uh, as you know, um, you have um, I believe it's uh, 187 have already been produced, it's shortfall of 194. Chairman. Chairman, uh, I think we as an Air Force and a country would have been better suited to have those additional 194 airplanes already in the inventory and being participant in everything that's going on. And it may have changed some of that calculus for what our adversaries are doing. But we just completed the 2030 uh, Air Superiority ECCT study and those results have been outbriefed to the chief, and he's accepted those. And that rec one of the recommendations of that was not to restart the F-22 line. The major concern was that the funding that would be required would be significant and would take away from additional funding of somewhere else within the service that is probably higher priority. And, and there's nothing higher priority than air security. But the concern is that we would be five to 10 years away from the delivery of the first airplane, because 2009, when the line closed, all of those subcontractors have moved on to other things. We'd have to rebuild that base. It's not a short-term fix. And then when we started taking delivery of those airplanes, the airplane itself would be 20 years old, and we're ready for what's next. And that's part of what that study is recommending. So um, as we look at those requirements and the future capability, we think it's wiser to keep the investment in the F-35 at the production levels that we need for our fifth gen to fill in where the gaps were from the F-22 and that will allow us to bridge into what's the follow-on to those two platforms. General, I'm aware of that study, of course. And the, you know, our aspect of, of requesting the study that is in the House version of the bill is actually doing a holistic view of what would those elements be. 
uh, whether it be F-22 or not, we're going to need something more than just the F-35. Um, and I, I know that your concerns, as are you know, evident throughout the Air Force, uh, is, is budgetary. You would not want to cannibalize one system in order to be able to, to launch another. Um, but as um, I'm certain we're looking forward to, uh, as we have additional discussions, I am going to ask you, um, in our, as we close off our round, to give us the, uh, a greater uh, detail on, as you described, the F-35 and the fourth generation and how they work together. Um, having a, um, um, more cards in your deck of, um, of greater capability, I'm, I'm certain, will be important. So the study itself uh, gives us greater fidelity on some of the things that you identified. Um, it doesn't conclude. It really does that holistic assessment of what would it take, which could result in an, a, an additional, uh, a different airplane, but it certainly should look at recognizing the gap. You have a gap. Yes, we do. Um, what would it take to fill in that gap? Uh, and um, what are our overall all costs? So uh, I appreciate that, and we, we look forward, hopefully, to the Senate agreeing to getting a greater understanding of what are those missing elements to do the study. And I'll just rely on the uh, Chief of Staff saying it's not a crazy idea. Uh, with that, uh, Dr. Winster. Well, thank you. So a little, little bit somewhat off the main topic, but uh, overall air superiority. And we look at the global threats and potential threats and uh, you know, the ability to be a deterrent as well as to fight terrorism and to stay ahead of our traditional adversaries. <clears throat> Do you feel that we're positioned forward enough in the world in enough locations? Let me give you an example. And just an Army guy's observation serving in Iraq. Uh, <clears throat> I had it chance to go up to Sulaymaniyah in Kurdistan for a couple of days uh, while I was deployed for a year. And my thought as the war went on and as we were being more successful, and ultimately I'd say we won that war and we, since things have changed, we won that war and I thought the Kurdish air would be a great place for an air base. You know, it was the only place I went in Iraq where I didn't wear armor. We were loved. They love Americans. We'd be so central in the Middle East to have a show of force and authority there and what a great place this would be for an air base. And, and I still think that if, if the climate was right. But my question really comes down to do you think with today's threats that we have, uh, are we f forward positioned enough with our air forces to, to be comfortable? Sir, that's a great question, and you and I, based on your military background, look at it a little differently from our perspective. Your Air Force deploys really quick. It doesn't take us weeks and months. It's normally days and sometimes hours to get into place to do what we need to do. So I, I balance our ability to be forward with our requirement to defend our homeland and to be home where we get some of the best training. Because when I am forward at those bases, I kind of have to limit my training because a small country that loves us as a, you know, is an organization, is, an, is a, an American people, I still have to train outside their borders. And I, I don't want to give up things to my adversary where they can see what I'm doing on a regular basis. So we have some strengths for that. And on that argument, if you look at my active duty F-15 placements right now, if you're an active duty F-15 maintainer, F-15C maintainer or pilot, your only places are Japan and United Kingdom. We have no continental U.S. for those to go. So if that's what you do, you're either overseas from one or the other location, or you're flying with one of our guard units that's flying them here in the continental U.S. for a homeland defense mission, or you're on a staff, and again, I only have 25% of my, my staff. So. Uh, it's not easy already to, we're fairly forward deployed. Yes, there is that deterrent, that fight tonight effort, and, and that applies both in the Pacific and Europe, and uh, we're just as concerned with everything going on in Europe, so we started uh, rapid Raptor deployments to where overnight airplanes show up and nobody knows that they're coming other than the host nation that's invited us and the training that we do. And we're seeing that from a lot of our new NATO allies saying, come more, come more often and stay longer. Uh, and we do understand that, but we do have to have that balance between being able to train and have that white space at home uh, to also be ready for it. Yeah, and we're even seeing movement by the Chinese, uh, as you know, uh, sure. without going into too much detail, um, that is concerning. And so I'm sure that that's something that you have to watch on a, on a constant basis. Um, 
So as we're talking about fourth and fifth generation, you know, one of the things that I think as members of Congress and, and the military as well, our role is to always be looking towards the future. Uh, what do things look like 20 years from now? And uh, so I'm just curious how we're doing on sixth generation. We're doing well at an unclassified level. Very good. That's all I needed to hear. All right. <laughs> and, uh, and then I guess one more question I, I, I do have is, is specific to Wright Patterson. And so, how important is the role of Wright Patterson uh, in, in Ohio uh, for the future of our air dominance? I'm impressed every time I come to Wright Patterson. The people I see around on the base, it's just a, the density of those smart, um, scientists that are warrior technicians that, that have come here, uh, they, they really seed our labs across America. So uh, we come here from an airman's perspective and try and give that operational flavor so that as we look at the things that they're studying and doing at Wright Pat, how that might apply to us. Uh, we actually have some of those, that 25% of fighter pilots, we've got some of those on the staffs here at Wright Pat and AFMC just to help General Palakowski and the team out so that we know what can bridge and what is not going to go anywhere from, from what they're looking at. Uh, and quite often they'll say, hey, this is success. We just don't know how to use it. And you get that in the hands of an operator or a maintainer, and they say, I know what to do with that. So how we work together with it, um, a lot of that happens right here at Wright Pat, and, and that's kind of the focus of where we get a lot of our research. Very good. Thank you. I yield back. Sir. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, General, um, I, I'm also on the Foreign Affairs Committee and chaired the Middle East and Asia uh, committees in the past, and we've had innumerable hearings with respect uh, to Asia and uh, China in particular, and their uh, how aggressive they've been of late um, in the air and and uh, on the sea, you know, building islands and uh, and now militarizing them, much to the chagrin of a lot of our allies in the region, from Japan to South Korea, Philippines, Taiwan, and and countries that we have better and better relations, like Vietnam now, uh, they're all very, very concerned. Uh, do you believe that the current planned F-35 uh, squadrons are adequate to maintain a, a forceful presence in the Pacific theater while maintaining our current uh, commitments in, in Europe and the Middle East, for example? And with current uh, force projections, do you believe that we will be able to maintain our air superiority with respect to, to China uh, over the next decade and, and into the future? Congressman, that's a great question because the next decade really is of concern. If we're acquiring 48 F-35s a year, China will have more fifth gen fighters 15 to 20 years from now than we have based in the Pacific. And that's including what Marines are doing uh, in Japan and what the Air Force intends to do with future basing and, and where we're going in the Pacific. So in a fight tonight scenario, they may actually outnumber us with airplanes like that than, than, than we are. Um, that does get back to that forward deploy question that we spoke about earlier. What's in theater does matter, and in both Pacific and Europe, we look to make sure that we've got sufficient to deter, but that we've also got ready forces at home that can reinforce. Uh, and we are concerned. The number of F-35s to procure a year is probably closer to 60. The program record says we should be at 80 a year, and that would allow us to have the numbers there sooner before China can get their fifth, uh, fifth generation airplanes fully operational. Uh, that we think that would deter that conflict, but I don't think it's going to stop them from still building in the islands, and we'll continue our, our, our freedom of navigation exercises in the air and on the sea to, to deter and, and make sure they recognize what we consider international laws and norm to be. Thank you. Thank you, John. And, uh, one area we haven't uh, touched on really uh, yet uh, this morning, and since this will be my final question, I'll at least touch on it, and that, that's that with the increased reliance of uh, unmanned aerial vehicles, UAVs, or drones, um, how do you see the integration of UAVs uh, with the planned strategic uh, roles of our F-35s, for example, and our other assets. How does this all fit in and how important is it? Well, if we looked at today's uh, UAVs, we would probably think of it from a fourth generation perspective, uh, the way they're being employed with uh, a manned cockpit somewhere back in the U.S. or wherever they happen to be flying. And, and, and again, we're doing that in our Guard and Reserve and our active. 
uh, teaming up with somebody that's foreign deployed. Uh, I think, though, as we look at the, the air superiority study that we've been talking about, part of that does talk about UAV teaming and doing that in more of an autonomous fashion where you have that machine-to-machine -machine communication so that while we still have people in the loop, they're not having to necessarily do as much as they're doing today from a physical flying. So maybe then one crew can fly five UAVs or one manned aircraft can have a dozen UAVs flying off of it, taking commands and signals from it. So we are looking at that from that air superiority study, which would make this much more uh, defensible uh, and the risks that you can take with an unmanned system or at least no person in the forward of the airplane uh, can actually help you with that if somebody is back, uh, you know, flying from somewhere else. Uh, that's a different <coughs> risk calculus, and we're, we're willing to do that to achieve our nation's goals. So that is part of that study, and that's part of the family of systems. So it's not going to be a single silver bullet that solves any one of these. Uh, I think it will be a follow-on to the F-8, I'm sorry, the F-22 and the F-35, not just the 15 and 16, but it will also be improvements to our current UAVs that will all come together with our cyber and the assets that we bring from space to, to make this uh, a solvable problem. Thank you, General. And Mr. Chairman, yielding back, I'd just like to say this, I think this has really been a great hearing. I think the information that we've, uh, we've received from the General here is very important and helpful to us, and we'll take it back to our colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Thank you. I'd like to follow up on uh, the last question that uh, Mr. Shabbat just asked. General, could you talk about the importance of voice and data communication in future air dominance? Very important. Um, and right now, voice communication is a lot of times our primary mode of communication. Our fifth gen and our fourth gen don't talk as well together as we'd like to machine to machine. So we're actually using the air crew voice to, to get the information back and forth. And I would be honest, that's probably third, third generation. Uh, so we are working on a couple projects and efforts to make sure that we can get communication and awareness that the fifth gen airplanes bring down to the fourth gen fleet to our command and control to everything else so that all of our sensors that are so far forward and doing great work because they can penetrate air defenses uh, come back and provide that information to everybody so that makes it critically important and we have a couple different paths that we're working on uh, not all of it is based in the air some of it will be land based some of it will be uh, space based so it's a family of systems again to get to that solution Thank you. Um, General, could you talk about the impact, any reduction in the 1,763 aircraft requirement uh, would have on ACC's capability and capacity and readiness to meet the requirements for fifth generation fighter aircraft to assume air dominance in support of the national military strategy? Uh, Congressman, it, it's hard to talk about that reduction because 1763, if we're producing, let's say, 60 a year, that's still buying F-35s out in the 2030s. So uh, I would, I'm less concerned about the overall number and, and the rate that we're acquiring to make sure that we can deter and defeat, if necessary, our, our adversaries in the next decade or so. If our further study in 6th Gen says that we're able to develop and come up with a family of systems that allows us to stop production early in the F-35 and move into something else, I think we, we're willing to do that. But we don't know what that number is at this point, so uh, I'd rather not speculate. Thank you. General, I really appreciate your testimony today, and uh, I just again want to uh, commend Chairman Turner for his leadership on uh, the Tactical Air and Land Subcommittee and what he's done to protect Wright Pat, build a consensus in the Ohio delegation to help further our national security and make sure that uh, we can be a major player in that here in Ohio through Wright Pat and, and the things that are happening at Wright Pat, I want to just uh, comment uh, and add to the comments that all my colleagues have said. Wright Patterson is a very important strategic asset for the United States, not just for the United States Air Force, but for the United States and to the thousands of men and women who are working here at this base to help ensure that you can provide air superiority, General. Uh, I just wanted to say thank you to them and thank you to Congressman Turner for making sure that uh, he supports them and our national military the way he's doing. And I wanted to acknowledge his leadership. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. 
Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> General, I, I appreciate in your comments to uh, what Dr. Wenstrup said and Representative Stiver said, uh, you focused on the on highlighting uh, what Wright-Patterson Air Force Base does. And I just want to underscore one aspect of the debate that we always have um, in, in Congress with respect to um, <clears throat> personnel and how it affects Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. But the issue of civilian career personnel uh, continues to be a, um, a ball batted around uh, in debates in, in Congress. But as you know, by what you just described, the engineers and scientists here at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, which are largely going to be career civilian, that populate NASIC, our National Air and Space Intelligence Center, and are doing the assessments on what our adversaries, like China, are, are doing and what uh, we need to make certain we put in your hands uh, to scope what the threat is. Um, the um, you know, Air Force Institute of Technology, uh, of course, you know, there we have the graduate school program here at, uh, at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, populated by professors and, and assistants and those that make that system work, largely, again, going to be career uh, civilian. Uh, the Air Force Research Labs, the engineers and scientists that, that really try to define what's the possible, uh, because here at wright Pad, it's not just the battlefields of today, which are also focused, but it's also the battlefields of tomorrow. What, what can we uh, push in our boundaries of knowledge, uh, just as the Wright brothers did, to make certain that you have that, that air of dominance? And of course, all of the acquisition support uh, that we have here uh, that's necessary for contract management, the oversight that we expect our government to do is done largely by career uh, civilians. So thank you for highlighting the, the fact that, that they play an important role in your combat command and in ensuring our, uh, our dominance. I want to go back to that topic again of, of dominance. You, um, in the beginning, foreshadowed the issue of fifth generation and fourth generation flying together. Um, you also foreshadowed that um, our intent to retire fourth generation, and as we look through 2030, uh, we're going to be in a blended um, um, uh, formation. Uh, could you please give us a, a description, if you will, that they, uh, where people can understand how does fourth and fifth generation work together? Uh, how is it going to ensure our capability uh, as we look to that time period where fourth generation may be retired? Yes, sir. In an unclassified format, the air superiority approach, because that's what we're primarily talking about from, the, from this with a fifth and fourth gen working together, uh, can get sticky pretty quick. Uh, so in not so much an air superiority role, but in today's fight, when the F-22s fly over Syria, their sensors see so many things and share that across the spectrum uh, through our com com command and control efforts that uh, fourth gen fighters that would not otherwise have been aware have much more situational awareness. Uh, and that's what fifth gen brings to the fight. In an air superiority type of a role, we expect the fifth gen to be the only things that can initially penetrate, go in and make some of the initial kills to take or reduce an enemy's IAD, which will then allow fourth generation to even participate in the battle. Uh, and if that's a long distance away, it may take days and weeks to get air superiority. Uh, if it's something near, it just may take multiple sorties over a day or two period. But if it's truly in a highly contested environment that's going to include an integrated air defense where it's both aircraft and SAMs and the entire uh, package that an adversary brings against us, uh, fourth generation may not have much play in that for a while until the air superiority portion is gained uh, and our adversary recognizes that this is important to us, we're not going to give up and we're going to continue to risk our fifth gen aircraft, our people, the things that we need to do to get the, the nation's um, tasking done, and then fourth generation will be able to step up and, and participate at that point. That's our concern, uh, the, the blended effort. We're, we're leaning more towards fifth gen as quick as we can. So in other words, fifth generation can go into a contested environment and clear the way so the threat level is lowered so that fourth generation can go in and continue to fight in the contested environment. Yes, sir. Excellent. Thank you. Dr. Webster, closing comments, questions? Yeah, I did have uh, one other question. You talked about uh, about 700 pilots short from where you'd, you'd like to be. So where does the Air Guard come into play with that and is, uh, is their role helpful in that regard? Uh, yes, sir. And that, uh, when I say 700 pilots, that's fighter pilots. That we have shortages in other weapon systems also. But the Air Guard, uh, they are seeing similar vacancies, although not as fast as the Air Force is. They are probably only a couple years behind us. Uh, to be honest, they're on the leading edge of the airline hiring because uh, several of those have already uh, taken those, those jobs applications based on what they're doing, but continue to fly for the Guard, which is exactly what we're looking for uh, on a part-time basis. Um, 
where we're finding concern in the Guard is that they are deploying so much to support places that the active duty can't go to because of our readiness and our op tempo already mm -hmm. that someone's saying, I was deploying this much when I was on active, why would I expect to do that now that I'm in the Guard? And, and we're finding they're getting some pressures that they haven't seen in decades before based on their op tempo also. And I think they're in the same boat as we are. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so in conclusion, I want to thank you, General, for being here today and for everyone here uh, accommodating us so well. And uh, it's been said by my colleagues here of the relentless nature of Chairman Turner in um, his concern for this base and for our Air Force and for our military in general. And uh, I can speak to it firsthand, serving on two committees with him and on his subcommittee. And uh, I thank him for his leadership in that regard. Thank you. I yield back. Well, I want to thank all my fellow members for attending. Um, as they've described, the uh, aspect of protecting Wright Patterson Air Force Base is both a game of advocacy and a game of whack-a-mole. Uh, every now and then, <laughs> we have to make certain that we do defend the assets that are here, but we also advocate for them. Uh, and every member here has been a part of that, and I greatly appreciate their support. Thank you for taking your Saturday uh, to come out and, and do this. But I want to assure you that it's not just a Saturday morning that these gentlemen have given. Uh, they're part of what Ohio deploys in order to protect Wright Patterson Air Force Base and, uh, and to uh, advance the Air Force. Uh, General, thank you for your service and thank you for your team giving their Saturday and also for the team from the Air and Land Subcommittee. We appreciate them traveling here to be able to do this. Uh, General Harris, we hope to welcome you back to Wright Patterson Air Force Base um, and, um, the, um, and the assets that, that are here. But thank you for your leadership and thank you for giving us this insight. As you know, uh, from your position, uh, your answers are not just informative, they actually translate into policy. Uh, we have to take them back and place them in legislative um, uh, decision making and in debates uh, that help us ensure uh, that you have what you need. So thank you for helping us today. Sure. With that, we'll be adjourned.